Yes, thank you, Francesca. And uh, hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here and I'm happy that um, you joined. I'm hoping that still some more participants uh, will join us throughout the presentation, but we're just going to uh, uh, continue with the program. So what I want to, would like to do is give you um, a first introduction to um, data management and in particular focus on the organizing, processing and storing part of the data. And a lot of the things we'll discuss today and on Thursday are based on the SESTA Data Management Expert Guide, on which I will tell you a little bit more in a moment as well. I will just see how I can. Yeah. So one of the things that is always important to think about: why do we? Why are we actually interested in research data management, and why is it so important for for us and mainly for us as researchers? Because most of you who are joining us today are. Uh, researchers, as Francesca already mentioned. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of a background of why this is important to you. And I think there are three main things that I wanted to highlight. So one is that um, those of you in the Netherlands are probably familiar with the case of Diedrich Stapel. And those of you who are not from the Netherlands may have heard about it as well because it made sort of international news. And this was um, a Dutch professor who um, in the end turned out to have made up all of his uh, or almost all of his research line. So there was a large case of fraud in the Netherlands with this professor, which also shook up the whole scientific community and um, really called for more proper management of data and also to ensure that the data that we're publishing is actually uh, verified and that things like this cannot happen again. So I've now copied a couple of news articles from this case. It was really very interesting to see how this could have happened and definitely something that we want to consider when we talk about research data management. Um, the other thing that I think is also very relevant to us personally is that research data management can help you and as a researcher yourself, because it gives you an opportunity to structure your work. And also, for instance, imagine that a colleague of your comes to you and asks you about your research and wants to have some information. So if your desk is sort of cluttered, like here on this image, then it might be really difficult for you to find back that information. And you will, you will have a lot of difficulties actually answering questions or also maybe answering questions from reviewers who want some additional information. But if you, um, if you engage in proper research that I mentioned from the beginning, then it will be easier for you to retrieve information, to answer questions about your research that you might have or that somebody else might have. So it is uh, in a way for yourself also to structure your work and make sure that you know uh, where everything is and all of the information is sort of in a centralized place. And then last but not least, um, we see much more often that data can actually be reused and that the information that you have been collecting as a researcher might be something that is just the missing piece of the puzzle for somebody else. So really the value of data also um, tells us that research data management is important because you might be able to help somebody else answer an interesting scientific question. And I think in the end, all that we want to do as scientists is make sure that uh, we answer questions, right? And we sort of evolve our knowledge. And by making sure that our data is um, documented well, we might be able to solve, to help others solve new, new problems. So in the end, what we, what we do with research data and also by creating a data management plan is we are, uh, we are, we are working um, on responsible science, which is also the, the topic and the, the title of this workshop. So by, um, looking into data management and creating a data management plan, you make it easier to find and understand data, but it also increases the impact. So as I just mentioned, it might enable you to uh, share your research with somebody else, make it reusable, and thereby help people to uh, answer new questions. So you have an increased impact, you make your research reproducible, which can prevent this fraud case that I was mentioning at the beginning, and also increase the reuse potential and what might also be important is that more and more funders now oblige you to, um, to have a data management plan and to create this. So by doing this from the start, you also comply with the funder mandates. And the goal in the end would be that this comic that I am having here on my slide is something from the past so that we don't only focus on the publications and that the data is sort of somewhere but not really visible because the data is actually the most important part of your research. And it is basically the things that others can reuse and that can increase the impact. So 
sort of a shift towards um, more value on the data that we collect and maybe a little bit less value or these equally valuable on the publications. And uh, research data management is at the core also of what we what we now call the, the FAIR principles. And um, I'm sure many of you may have heard about these principles and the idea that we should make our research data FAIR. And um, this is really what, it's, what will be coming back uh, a couple of times also in our workshop. So I'm just going to go through this briefly if you're not so familiar with the, with the FAIR principles. So FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And the goal is that we want to, by proper research data management, increase our, um, the fairness of our data. And so FAIR, uh, the findable uh, part of FAIR, basically translates to making your research discoverable. So it is about the automatic discovery of relevant data sets. And metadata should be easy to find by both humans and machines. And it should have a persistent identifier, which we will talk a little bit about later as well. The accessible part um, talks about how your data can be accessed and how it can be reused and that limitations on the use of data, but also um, the, the access rights and what you can and cannot do with the data should be explicitly um, stated so that people know where, where and how they can access the data. Um, data should also be interoperable, which means that the data and the metadata should use standardized terms, so controlled vocabularies, and have references to other metadata that can be read by uh, humans and also by machines. And lastly, data should be reusable. So the idea is that uh, information attached to your data should tell you how humans, but also computers, can um, access and reuse the information. So this is about providing licenses, providing information for reuse of the data sets. And these are the, the in a nutshell, a uh, couple of things about the FAIR principles. And as I mentioned, this will come back uh, later in this presentation as well. So now that we've kind of covered um, that data management is important and that also we should be aiming to make our uh, data FAIR, the question is, how do we actually do that? So research and management, maybe you now think, okay, this is important, but how do I do that? What can I do with my data? And in what way uh, can I get help for this? Because it is it is quite a, a challenge to make the, to make all of this uh, possible for your own data set. And this is why we uh, at SESTA have developed the SESTA Data Management Expert Guide, which is what we will focus on in this uh, workshop. So the Data Management Expert Guide or the DMAC is a guide on research data management or RDM. And it is developed for early career researchers, mainly in the social sciences. So focusing really on uh, the social science researchers, often collecting quantitative or qualitative data. Um, and the idea was that we wanted to provide useful information on research data management in one central place. And this guide was created uh, by the SESTA training team. And SESTA, as Francesca mentioned, is this consortium of social science data archives. And it was created between 2017 and 2020, but is um, continuously updated so that we can include more relevant information. The DMAC is free to use at sesta.eu slash DMEG, and it has a CC by SA license. So everything that is on there is meant to be reused also by trainers. But if you find something interesting, it is really meant to be used and reused by everybody interested in research data management. And what we are going to do today is talk a little bit more in detail about this data management expert guide and how it can help researchers to make their data uh, more fair, but also to learn how to properly document and, and manage uh, their research data. So the DMAC also helps you to create uh, your own data management plan, which is something that we ask you also to do in between today and the uh, Thursday. So the data management, um, uh, the DMAC has a data management plan checklist, which can be used to answer questions for your own study. And as I mentioned already a bit earlier, so the a data management plan can be a really useful tool for you to collect all of the information about research data management. So it can help you to think ahead, but also um, is the one place for you to manage your project in an easy and overview, uh, give you an overview of your project in an easy way. 
Um, it also can help you to clarify the budget and in in a way it's, it's a tool to, to help you make your data more fair and collect all of the relevant information in one place. So this is um, something that you can do um, with the help of the DMAC and this checklist that the DMAC provides. So I'm also inviting everybody to have a look at the at the website um, and in particular look at it um, after today's session and we will talk about it more on Thursday as well. So the, the DMAC follows the data lifecycle and this is a version of the data lifecycle that we uh, use in the data management expert guide. So the idea of the data lifecycle is that you have different phases in your research where data management is important and where you have to ask yourself different questions. So it starts with the, with the planning of your study and then goes over to the organization and documentation of data in your, on your project, the processing of data, the storage, and also the protection of, um, of data. And I'll, we'll have a closer look at the DMAC in a minute. So um, this is where we'll talk a little bit more about the different aspects and also give some practical guidance already on what you can do to um, manage your own project. So if we, if you would go to the to the web page, um, so sesta.eu slash DMEG, this is what you would see. So it's a part of the SESTA training activities, and this is the front page of the data management expert guide. And um, you will also see the different chapters. And our Slack channel actually also is organized along the same chapters. So we're hoping we would have questions and make sure that um, they can ask them in the in the specific channel. So uh, DMAC has uh, seven different chapters, which conform to the life cycle that I just and that's, uh, planning, organizing, processing, and storing of data in this present. And then uh, my colleague, Emily Kalkam, who uh, Francesca also already introduced, will talk a little bit more about the protection of data and in particular the GDPR and how we deal with uh, sensitive data and personal data in the social sciences. So this is um, a separate presentation because we want to spend a little bit more time talking about this aspect, which is very relevant to lots of social scientists. And then uh, on Thursday, we'll dive a little bit deeper into the archiving and publishing and the discovery of data. And in particular, also the importance of um, trusted and trustworthy digital repositories, like we are also at DANS. So this is something that we'll talk a little bit more um, about on Thursday. So if we're, uh, if we're looking again at the, at the life cycle, so as I mentioned, the different chapters in the data management expert guide follow this life cycle. And the first uh, chapter of the data management expert guide is about planning your research. And a couple of things I've already mentioned. So um, in, the, in the planning of your research, you really start sort of describing your project and thinking about the data that you will collect. And it's important to think about what kinds of data this is and what is needed for your project. And in terms of a data management plan, in this, in this phase, you would collect all of the basic information. So what is your project about? What kind of data are you collecting? But also sort of basic information like contact details of the involved researchers and grant information and what is um, nice here already is that you can start already by collecting also persistent identifiers and in particular ORCIDs of the involved researchers. And I wanted to ask you uh, whether you are actually aware of ORCIDs and whether you have one yourself. So I've created this little poll that I'm going to try and launch now. And I'm really curious if this will work. <laughs> Okay, so nobody who says that they have no idea, which is really nice. And most people say that they, that they know and they have an ORCID, which is great. And some people say they think they've heard about it. So I'm just gonna close this now. So what I wanted to say, so for those of you who have heard about it, but don't really know what it is. So an ORCID is a, an ID for researchers and it's meant to be something persistent and also making it uh, possible to identify you uniquely. So for instance, some people might have a very common name and then it's really difficult to know whether a certain research paper is by you or by somebody else. And the idea by using an ORCID, which is a persistent identifier for a person, is that this becomes easier. And if you collect this information and also provide this information to others, 
Um, and for instance, also to your funding agency, to your journal paper. The idea is that we can then link information much more easily and much more automated. And that will then help us, for instance, to find information relevant to your project, but also it in the end will reduce the administrative burden for a researcher. And um, an ORCID in this case is an ID that you can ask for yourself. So if you do not yet have an ORCID, you can actually sign up for it now and create this and then mention it everywhere where it's possible so that all of the research that you're doing is actually connected to um, you and yourself. Um, yeah, so great that a lot of people already know. So I've put in this presentation and the presentations are all available through the agenda as well. So if you're interested to know more, I've put in a couple of links also explaining persistent identifiers and particularly ORCID as well, if you're interested to talk about this a little bit more. And then I'm going to continue with my presentation. Perfect. Okay, so then, um, as I mentioned, in this planning phase, you would collect all of the basic information, including information about your collaborators, their ORCIDs, grants, um, but also you would think a little bit about roles and responsibilities as well already. So for instance, um, if you are reusing data from somebody else, or if you are collaborating with others, then it's really important to know sort of who's responsible for the data management and who is, um, who is involved in and in what role, for instance, when it comes to sharing the data. So are there specific rules from the organizations you're collaborating with? Are there specific people you need to, be, you need to involve? And having all of this information clarified at the start of your project can be really helpful. So the data management expert guide gives you an overview of the different questions that you can ask and also about the roles and responsibilities you can think about. So for instance, in this case, um, who's the contact person of your project? Who is the data owner? And who is responsible for the data management plan and the updating and these sort of things? So this is something that is um, good to think about at the beginning of your project and have it all in one place so that whenever at a later stage you need this information, you can come back to it and find it in an easy way. Um, the other thing that is good to think about at the beginning of a project is also whether there are related costs for data storage and data management. So often this is done by your own institute, but it might be the case that, um, there, that you need specific software or hardware or that you have a particularly large study that is um, that requires additional uh, storage space, for instance. And if you know these things in advance, you might even be able to get some funding for it when you're applying for a grant. So often researchers you know, have their own project and they apply for a grant in the Netherlands for, with NWO, for instance. And this is something that um, in, the, in the past, at least, we haven't thought about that much. But now, nowadays, if you have a really big and complex project, you might be able to actually get some funding for this and also get yourself some help with the data management. So this is something to, um, to be aware of, and it's good to think about that in the beginning of your project. So um, I'm going to go over to the second chapter. But of course, there's much more information in the data management expert guide itself. So if you're interested, um, have a look there and, and really look at the resources that are there. There's much more tips and tricks um, in there than I will cover in this short presentation. So the, the second um, phase or the second chapter of the DMAC is about organizing and documenting your data. And some of the things that I wanna, wanna highlight here is that um, some one thing that is uh, covered is to think about file structures um, and how you're organizing your files. And this can be also very helpful to think about that um, before you start having all your data come in and also think about uh, maybe if you have examples from other researchers that have similar, um, similar files or similar research and similar analysis that you want to do. And of course, this depends on the type of data and also the analysis software and whether or not you want to link, for instance, with other data sets. But the DMAC gives a couple of examples for qualitative and quantitative data. So this might be really something that would be interesting for you to look at and think about for your own project. Um, and then there are also some uh, guidance on file naming, some best practices are included in the DMAC, and also some examples on how you can structure your files in such a way that um, the file naming makes sense and is consistent and that it also helps you to more easily find the information that you want 
and also make it more easy for you to sort of keep an overview of your, your file names. So I'm not going to read all of this to you, but um, if you're interested, there's a lot of guidance on this in the in the DMAC as well. And one of the things that I do want to mention already is that it's important not to include personal information in file names. So I'm sure most of you are aware of this, but sometimes when you start out with your research, you think it might be a good idea if you have, for instance, interview subjects that you put that information in the file name, but actually file names do not never contain personal information. And thinking about this at the beginning, I think helps you in not having to rename everything at a later stage. Um, the organized chapter also talks a little bit about the folder structure, which of course, again, depends on your projects and the data collected and also maybe whether or not you have collaborators, but the data management expert guide gives examples for qualitative and quantitative data. And here you can see, for instance, um, a, a folder structure example for survey data that explains a little bit about how you could structure your folders in such a way that it's easy to find you back your information. And, um, and again, I think this is something that we think about it at the start of our project that makes it easier for us to find back the information later on. Um, the last part of the organize, organize and document uh, chapter is about metadata. And metadata is something that is uh, very important in terms of um, the FAIR principles. I will talk about this in a, in a minute. But um, it can be a bit of a confusing term, I think, to researchers who are not so familiar with data management and archiving. So metadata broadly is defined as data providing information about one or more aspects of the data. So metadata, broadly speaking, is data about data. So that's where this, this meta part comes in. And in terms of the information that is important for our data management plan, we distinguish the project level details and the data level details. And um, the chapter in the DMAC outlines exactly what kind of information you would think of. So for instance, um, in terms of the project, um, it's important to describe um, these sort of eight things listed here. So for what purpose data was created, what a data set contains, how the data was collected, who was involved and when, how it was processed, and also um, the different manipulations that were done to the data and whether or not there were certain things that you did to ensure the quality of the data and also how the data can be accessed. So really sort of broadly describing everything that has happened to your data and how that was done and how also people can access data in it. And next to this sort of information of the project, we also have information at the data level. So which is more related to the data files and the variables. So this is, for instance, about um, what kind of data file do we have? What, what is the file type, the format? Um, what kind of scripts have been used to process the data? And um, more on a, on a variable level even, uh, what are the names and labels and descriptions of variables? So for instance, if you have a, a survey, you might measure certain concepts or have certain questions that are linked to particular variables. And having, that, um, having a description of this can be very useful uh, to also make it easier for others to understand your data, but even for yourself. So for instance, you might classify your participants into male and female by using a code zero and one and writing down which, which, which one is zero and which one is one. So whether zero is male and one is female or the other way around, it's very useful um, to have that information so that you don't have to look it up every time that you are sort of looking again at your data. And the DMAC gives examples for qualitative and quantitative data for this to make this easier for you as well. And as I mentioned already, so the metadata and documentation, metadata and documentation is really crucial for FAIR. If we look at the FAIR principles, metadata is actually mentioned in, in uh, three out of the four uh, FAIR principles. And um, so it's really something that is crucial to enable us to better organize our data and make your data more useful. So this is um, one thing that I wanted to mention and the FAIR principles, as I said, come back a couple of times again. The next uh, chapter that I want to look at is the processing chapter. So once you've planned your research, you've organized your files, then you are actually collecting your data. And then uh, the question is, how do you process your data? And 
Of course, a lot of the analysis depend on, on your own project and might be very variable, but there are a couple of things that are generally applicable might help you to better process your data and process it in a way that you can um, also afterwards understand what is easier for others to understand as well. So one of the things that we want if we process data is to minimize errors in data processing. And the data management expert guide gives a couple of examples. So there's some information on coding and some information on weights, which is mainly related to survey data. So as I mentioned earlier, the DMAC really focuses on social scientists and focuses on examples specifically to social scientists and in particular to survey research. But there's also some information on qualitative um, data and qualitative coding in there. So this might be nice for you to look at. Um, and they have some uh, guidance on how to avoid um, making errors or minimizing um, errors when coding and, and also this information on weights that might be interesting for you. Um, and I've just copied here a couple of things. So there's um, there is a uh, there are a couple of recommendations on how you can minimize er errors in survey data entry. Um, and as you can see here, so there there are a couple of things like check the completeness of records, reduce the burden of manual data entry. And for each of those in the DMAC, you can find more information telling you exactly sort of what are the steps you can take to make this as easy as possible and also minimize the the errors there. So this is some guidance that you can find in the data management expert guide. And also one of the things um, that are good to think about in the beginning is the, the file formats. And we don't really think about it necessarily now, but the question really is, can I open this file in five years from now? And there are some data formats that are just more sustainable than others. And one of the good things that we'll talk about a little bit more uh, on Thursday also is that data archives actually transform data for you. So for instance, if you would deposit your data um, with, with DUNS and you have an SPSS file or a statistical file, we actually transform these into more sustainable files. Because generally you could say that anything that requires a proprietary property, like a commercial pro, um, uh, product like SPSS or MATLAB, for instance, is less sustainable than something that is uh, based on open source like Python or R. And also um, sort of, for instance, Word files are less um, sustainable than just saving something in a text file. And these are things that you can think about at the beginning of your project. And also maybe when you make decisions on what analysis software to use and also whether you want to use, for instance, a customized program to analyze your data or something more open source like Python or R, because it might help you to open your data at a later stage. And also, for instance, if you switch to another institute that might not have a license for a particular program, this is something that can help you if you make sure that your data is also stored in an open format. Um, but a little bit more about that in terms of archiving also on Thursday. We'll talk about this a little bit more, but it's something that I think at least I would have, uh, I wish I had thought about that before I did my research project because we were using more closed programs. And I think in the end, I would have liked to invest more in open source programs that make it easier for me to sort of use my data anywhere um, and also share my code and everything. So it's, I think it's something that is good to consider at the beginning. Um, and then the last part of the process chapter is about data authenticity and versioning. So the idea is that we should really try and know what happened to our data when, and also that that helps us to ensure the quality of the data and um, that it's important to document changes and tr keep track of the different versions. And the DMAC gives some practical tips on versioning and logging changes that I think are interesting for you as well. Again, they look at uh, qualitative and quantitative data as well. So give some examples for both, which I think would be interesting. The next chapter in the DMAC that I want to talk about is the storage of data. So we've talked a little bit about the planning, the organizing and uh, the processing and then when it comes to data storage, there are also a couple of things that are good to consider. So storage is often organized by your own institute. And I think the first step for everybody when you are starting a research project is to find out what are the policies that are happening at your institute and what is 
sort of organized by them and what are things that you have to organize yourself. And one of the questions that are important to answer is how much space do you actually need and who needs to have access? So is this a project that you're doing all by yourself or do you need to um, have others, have collaborators have access to the project? And what the DMAC does is um, outline a couple of the different uh, storage facilities that you would use. So you can see here the portable devices, cloud storage, local storage or network drives. And they outline the advantages and disadvantages of each of those, but also the precautions that you have to take for if you're using sensitive personal data, um, which is something we'll talk about a little bit later today as well, um, as particularly the, uh, when Emily is talking about the GPR. So some, uh, some extra considerations are in place if you're working with personal data, and particularly if you're working with sensitive personal data. Um, but I think the DMAC gives a good overview of the different options and also some things to consider there. Um, the next thing next to uh, storage is obviously uh, also a backup strategy. So you really don't want to lose your data because you have spent a lot of time and effort in collecting that. So it's important to make sure that your data is properly back up, backed up. And this is also something that is often organized by your institute. So again, the first thing would be to find out what the policies are. And then the DMAC gives a couple of steps that you can take, these 10 steps mentioned here, to um, sort of think about the backup strategy for your own project. And it starts, as I mentioned just now, with finding out what your institution does, and then also looking at your project and what you want to back up. Um, decide how many backups you would need and how frequently, where this will be stored and how the how much storage you would need for that. And also whether there are some kind of tools that can help you automate, automate this. Um, and um, the other steps are about sort of how long backups need to be kept and when they will be destroyed and also what you can do to protect personal data. So in case you have personal data um, that you have some extra responsibility to protect this in a way. And then there is uh, also some advice on disaster recovery plan and also assigning responsibilities. And I think this is again, something that is really important to discuss with your supervisor as your institution, because often there are some automatized um, procedures in place that can help you to uh, to uh, do the backup automatically. And most of us, most of researchers are not, do not have to do all of this by themselves, but it's good to think about this uh, at the start of your project and also find out what the policies are and whether you might need more for your specific project. And the last part that is, dis that is discussed in the storage sector is about uh, security. And of course, security is, is crucial in particular when we're working with personal or sensitive personal data which most of social scientists uh, do. And the DMAC gives a couple of examples about uh, possibilities for, for instance, using passwords or encrypting your data, but also about a physical network and computer security and how to securely dispose data and also some of the organizational aspects. And again, here, your own institute probably has some, uh, some things in place already, but it's good to think about this and also to think about um, sort of what what um, is the sensitivity level of the data that you have? And if you have personal data, in what way does this need to be stored, shared, or is it something that maybe um, you can keep for your just amount of the pseudonymized data? So this is, and this is something we'll talk about more in the in the next presentation of my colleague. So I think this is also a nice bridge to uh, the next presentation. 